All right, hello everyone. Welcome to module five. First, I'm going to recap a few things from module four. Um, spend half an hour with you guys. I'm going to do a little something different today too. I went through some of the questions that you're asking in uh, your homework assignments, and I think they're pretty brilliant. Like there's clear some clear engagement and some brilliant questions being asked. So I'm actually going to pull some of them and do my best to try to answer them um, in the context of the course. All right, before we get started with that, I want to share a couple of other small ideas with you. Um, another one around competence that's kind of archaic is the DIKW model. It's, a, it's an old framework. It's been around for a while. Um, data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. It's just another kind of hierarchical way of thinking about what we know, what we know to be true, or what we think to be true. Um, and I think you know, at the core, at the core is data. And, and one of the key things about leadership in the context of our knowledge is recognizing the importance of data across the board. And I know we teach this at Simon a lot, but the concept of data and collecting data. So one of the, one of the things I learned very early on in my leadership career was the importance of really capturing as much information as I possibly could in a systematic way. Like I built software products, so it seems obvious, but like in the early days, um, it was expensive to store large amounts of data. Um, so we didn't, and it turned out to be a grave mistake. Like the more information we have, the more we can use that, or more data we have, the more we can use that data to turn it into information. Um, and information is, is data that we can make decisions on that allows us to, information allows us to see the patterns um, but without the data you can't get information so you're blind without the data so like one of the, again one of the leadership lessons i learned early on was to collect as much data as you possibly can in a in as objective a way as possible because you never know how useful it's going to be in the future so you collect the data keep it store it forever there's no reason to get rid of it um, consumer behavior, employee behavior, like all the data that you could possibly gather is going to be useful to you at some point in the future. It's going to be more useful in the future because we have more and more technologies that are helping us take advantage of that data and information. Um, and then taking information and turning it into knowledge um, turns out to be really important. So information gives us patterns. So it's assimilating the data in a way that makes it useful. Knowledge is, is turning information to something we can actually make a decision on. And what they call wisdom at the center, at the core, wisdom is the ability to take the knowledge you have and apply it in different domains. And this is, this is a simple construct, but I think from a leadership perspective, you have to recognize that anything you feign to be wisdom without the data to support it is really just a facade. Remember the Johari window that we talked about? Like all the things that we think we know that we think other people don't know, that's probably a facade unless we can get out into the world and test it. You know, and the goal is to take as much of this data as we can and turn it into as much wisdom over time as we can. Um, and anyway, just a construct I thought uh, that I think that I find super useful. And I've got a slide deck here. I'll share, I'll share that with you as well real quick. Um, and I did include this set of diagrams um, in the slide deck that I shared up on Blackboard. So turn data into information patterns, patterns, the decisions that can come from patterns, that's knowledge. And when you can apply that knowledge across other domains, that's what we call wisdom. All right, interesting. Now, I also want to talk, I want to go back into the growth mindset. I shared with you guys a bunch of words, and I put, I put a bunch, I put a lot of them in, um, in the slide deck so that you have them. So you can see how I, as an example of how I've used it in the real world, like tactical use of the growth mindset versus a, a fixed mindset. And in my, in my lexicon, I've chosen to use the term, the phrase continuous innovation to represent the growth mindset. So you'll see that in my slide deck. But continuous innovation is what happens when you have a growth mindset. And when you, you maximize that on your team, 
you maximize that, you you set up a language where, or you set up an environment where failure is not only um, expected, failure is actually celebrated as long as you've learned from it. So if you set up your environment where the learning is what's celebrated, you're constantly learning. You have a set of best practices and that language is important. I don't like to use the language unless it's absolutely necessary of process or um, policy. Because when you have processes or policies, that's autonomy diminishing. Think, think uh, self-determination theory. So in the terms of competence, what we have is a set of best practices um, and there's always a better way. So if you, if you instill the mindset that there's always a better way, that's a growth mindset, a continuous innovation mindset, and you allow people to experiment as long as the intent is right, like the intent is to improve the way in which we're doing things, it's not just to buck the system. Um, you create an environment of psychological safety around experimentation, trial and error, and continuous learning, which results in continuous innovation. Um, and to, just to show you how serious I am about that um, and, and instilling a growth mindset tactically, we've even created a poster at ITX and it looks like this. So you see all the words, you'll see these in the deck. And this is an older version of it, but this is, and you'll see too that it's an older version. So if you look at some of the words, I've actually changed them over time. So you'll see different definitions in the deck than what you see here, but this is what we're after. And people get this on their first day of work at ITX. You'll see this hanging up all over our cubes. It's brand aligned, so it's kind of a good looking document. It's on good stock, so they tend not to throw it away. It shows up on their cubes and it gives us this shared sort of language that helps us build joint competence um, better as an organization. I found that to be incredibly valuable. And again, I think what's even more important is sitting down with your leadership and executive teams to create the definitions. So you come up with those definitions as a team and then periodically revisit them and make sure that they're still right. So again, supporting the growth mindset versus fixed mindset. So one of the questions that was asked um, in Blackboard in, in the homework assignment um, was from Ashish, it's how do you accelerate learning or knowledge sharing within a team, including and in starting with your own? Well, I think the starting point, if you remember the matrix that I showed you guys, the starting point is having some semblance of an understanding of what knowledge is important in your domain and where you are today. Because if you don't have that, it's hard to know where you should go. Um, and if you have it and you, and you can show people the path, like you show people, hey, here's a bunch of options for you, a bunch of things that you could do to learn and maybe even have some things. And a part of it is understanding what they care about, like understanding what your people, what your direct reports care about. Because if they're, like I said, if they're not growing and they're not learning, you can't possibly maximize their intrinsic motivation. Remember, competence is one third, approximately one third of human intrinsic motivation, being on a path to mastery, growing and learning having self-esteem, knowing how your contributions are going to apply to the to the shared team and to the greater goal. Um, yeah, so to accelerate learning and knowledge, Ashish, I think you have to start with a framework of understanding where you are and where you want to be. So start with creating competence around the gap, right? So start by creating competence around where you are authentically. And again, I use those behaviors. Remember in the matrix I showed I want to see that you've actually done this. Not enough to say, to check the box and say, yeah, I've done this, or I've actually completed a test or completed a course. I really don't care a whole lot about that stuff. I want to see that you can actually apply it. And so when you see the application in the wild, in your organization, uh, that's, that's where the real value is. It's not in the course taking, or it's not even in the achievement of an MBA, right? That's um, super helpful because it shows that you had the discipline and the um, put the effort in and the energy in to finish an MBA. But what really matters in the wild, everybody will tell you, is the actual or your ability to apply it. So you have to you have to go and apply the knowledge um, before it really becomes valuable to the organization. Um, you know, I can't you know I can tell you how many times I've hired people um, because of their resume, and you put them in the field, and it's like I have to train them all over again, or they're not really they're not a fit, like they don't actually have the competence. They may, it may have showed up on their resume, but it doesn't show up in the wild and I have to figure out how to, how to fill those gaps. Um, 
It's the application that matters. So measure the application, measure the behavior in the wild of the competence and um, at the highest level when your people can teach it to each other, when you have, when you have stru a structure in place to, to observe the teaching um, and to observe the advancement at the highest level. Remember the competence continuum, go through these different phases. Um, so I think the, the best tactic you could deploy to accelerate learning for both yourself, for your team, and for your organization, whatever that looks like, is to have an understanding of where you are today and have an understanding of where you think you want to be tomorrow or in the future. And, and then having a, a way in which a process, so to speak, a set of best practices um, within which you're gonna periodically revisit where you're at and where you wanna be and give people um, a sense of autonomy in helping you to fill those gaps um, across the board, all right? So um, let's switch back over. I'm gonna, I wanna go to the doc cam just to give you guys a little variety in terms of what you have to stare at here. So here's my doc cam. Make sure that comes into focus. Get my little button up here for lighting. Good. And I wanna talk about, I wanna go a little bit deeper on the growth mindset. So um, someone had asked, I think it was Rakesh. Yeah, Rakesh, using the example of Steve Jobs and his revival of Apple. His question is, is it possible to create such a language and environment? And if it is, if, if it is possible, then why doesn't every leader do it? Um, is it something that some people are blessed natively, like they're ta like talented leaders like Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, Bill Gates, they do it naturally um, and it can't be taught. It has, to, it has to be something you're born with or can you learn it from others' experiences. And my belief is this is what I'm trying to teach you through the through Carol Dweck's work. And this is, I think, particularly true for leadership. I don't think there's many leadership skills that aren't learnable. And if they're not, if they're learnable, then they're also teachable. And I think this, we talked about this in class. I think this is a key job, a key job of leaders is to make sure that people understand that they can grow, they can learn um, because you get a bunch of benefits out of that. So when you have a fixed mindset, according to Carol Dweck, you get some, you get some distorted um, results from people. Whereas if they have a growth mindset, this is where um, they believe that intelligence can be developed. And yeah, you know, we say that IQ is relatively fixed. That's another question somebody had in the homework that um, IQ is relatively fixed. Um, but it, it doesn't quite play out right in work. Like we know we can learn things like our IQ in terms of our capacity for intelligence may be somewhat fixed. I mean, I know psychologists have shown that's been a relatively stable measure. It's one of the most stable measures in the field of psychology um, for decades. But um, in any given domain, there's lots of things we can learn. And the minute we start thinking about our intelligence as fixed, and the intelligence is static, we start to, we start to, um, we won't, it's hard to thrive. Um, it leads to a desire to look smart. Um, when, when you believe, when you have a fixed mindset, this is what Carol Dweck says, you want to look smart. So you're taught to look smart. So, so this is the example here is like um, studying for the grade versus studying to learn. And when people do that, they actually will do, will, they'll take shortcuts, they'll cheat, so to speak. Um, Duran asked the question if cheating, deception, and perfectionism are largely tied to a fixed mindset. Um, in parentheses, he wrote, for example, individuals with this mindset are fixated on achieving flawless output. Then how does a perfectionist assess their own self-worth self and happiness? And is that assessment in terms of external rewards and accomplishment or an intrinsic satisfaction? I do think there's a relationship here between this fixed mindset and the concept of uh, like status and looking smart as external, as sort of like external motivators versus um, doing things and learning growth, building your capacity for the sake of actual um, learning and growth. So people want to look smart over here, they desire, they actually desire to learn, like they have an inherent desire to learn. And this is probably one of the most, if you're a parent, read the entire book and treat it like um, treat it like gold because as a parent, like this is one of the things I've found to be tremendously powerful in the raising of my own children um, to teach them 
how to learn and to thrive in failure and learning versus trying to look smart and get good grades and just be focused on the output versus the outcome, which is actually, actually should be learning. So in Carol Dweck's language, when, you're, when you have this mindset, this desire to look smart, to control the outcomes, and by the way, um, according to self-determination theory, competence, you know, competence is individuals seeking to control outcomes. This control allows them to experience mastery over a task or a domain. So they experience mastery over a task or a domain. Um, but this, if when you meld this, someone else asked, how does, um, how are flow and mindset interconnected? I'm going to come back to that. But there's, there's clearly, hopefully you can see the connection between competence and the growth mindset. So when you're faced with a challenge in a fixed mindset, when you're faced with a challenge, you're going to avoid it. So in the face of a challenge, people avoid, typically avoid challenges. They look for the easy things. And I've seen this across the board in my business over time. Like you give them a choice and people that have this mindset will avoid the, the hard stuff and they'll go for the easy stuff because they want to look smart. Whereas people that have a growth mindset, and this, this is a very changeable thing. Like a lot, you will find in the business world that a lot of people will come to you with a fixed mindset. And if you simply have them read the book Mindset by Carol Dweck, and you actually sit down and have this conversation with them about what you expect, they will change in the context of their work, they will change their mindset. This is a very changeable thing. It's hard, and you'll often see them defaulting back to these behaviors. But it's your job as a coach to ask these questions. Hey, are you do you really want to learn this? Or is this this, why would this be valuable to learn? You know, ask the coaching questions because these are folks who embrace challenge. They embrace, you know, the learning. And when there's an obstacle in Carol Dweck's language, they often give up or, well, you know, what? why don't you give that to someone else? Because you know what, I'm just not going to be, I don't have the time. I'm not capable to make up excuses. Whereas these folks will be like, yeah, you know what? I'm going to get after that. They will persist in the face of any setback, they will persist, all right? And in the concept, in the construct of effort, <clears throat> um, they see it as fruitless. So they're not willing to put it in because it's not valued. Like the effort isn't valued. Where, you know, in my household, like I said, like I said with my children and with my people, the thing you celebrate is the work they put in it's on the path to mastery. Like you celebrate, effort is celebrated. Celebrate the work. Like we have a little saying on my team, embrace the suck. If something, if something hurts, you know, that if it's, if it's painful, that means it's probably worth it. So look at the pain as a, as a, uh, something to learn from. Um, and if you have this mindset and you can teach this, I'm, this is a very teachable, learnable thing. And it will change the culture of the organizations that you lead. Just this one simple concept, if you take nothing else from the course, uh, Carol Dweck's life's work on uh, thinking about mindset will change the way in which you lead. Change the language that you use to lead and it'll change the way in which you lead. Now, when you have criticism, remember one of the first things I taught you guys, we talked about um, uh, criticism, spelling it wrong. We talked about advocates, right? And advocates, like what are, what are some of the key things you get from advocates? One of them is constructive negative feedback. Now, when you get this feedback, when you get this negative feedback, you have a choice. What are you gonna do with it? Well, well, we can make excuses or we can ignore it. We can ignore or make excuses for it. Um, and this is what you see if your organization or the people in your organization have a fixed mindset. They don't take that criticism up and celebrate it. So the same thing, when you get negative feedback that's constructive, when your customer, for example, or one of your employees comes to you and gives you a two-page diatribe about how, you, how you've messed up their lives or how they feel, um, you should embrace that and celebrate it and thrive from it and learn, um, learn from it. So you celebrate and learn from it. All right, so, and, and the way I do that, the way I've incorporated that into the culture is I teach my people to search out that constructive feedback. And when you get it from a customer, you celebrate that. 
That means the customer's an advocate. We put a label on it. That customer's an advocate. They took the time out of their day to tell you how bad you messed up and what you can do to fix it. Like that's a gift. And treating, treating criticism like a gift is a, is a key trait. It's one of the ways that you know you have a growth, you've achieved a growth mindset over a fixed mindset. Very important that you get that criticism um, in, in all aspects of leadership. Because if you, you know, again, the people that you lead, remember you lead multiple ecosystems of people, your customers, your team, maybe your stakeholders, the other parts of the organization, um, your communities. When you get feedback um, and you don't celebrate it, you choose to ignore it or make excuses for it, that's a key sign that you're in a fixed mindset. So look for these symptoms and look and then figure out how do I change from this to this? And it's as simple as changing the mindset uh, to a growth and learning mindset from a fixed outcome-based um, I'm sorry, output-based, measurement-based um, mindset. Now, it doesn't mean you can't, it mean, doesn't mean you shouldn't have metrics. Metrics are healthy because they give you clues about how you're progressing towards your goal. Um, but the goal can't be the metric. The goal's got to be the learning. And this is the key. The goal, the thing to celebrate is the learning, not the metric. The metric gives you um, an understanding of how well you're technically performing, usually the quantitative side of how well you're performing. Um, but it doesn't give you, it's not the thing that you should be celebrating. The, you always celebrate the learning. So, um, and when, when here's another sign. When you see, when you see an environment um, around the success of other people, the success of others, when you see people that feel threatened, that are threatened, or scoff at the success of others, you know you're in a fixed mindset, right? Or where you have comparison, or you have uh, where you have open comparison, us versus them. That's a fixed mindset. Versus when when you search out the lessons that are learned to be learned from the people who are successful. Search out and articulate the lessons that are learned to be learned. Lessons to be learned. All right, so these are the symptoms you're gonna to wanna to look for in your environment. And you're gonna to wanna to celebrate these symptoms. When you see this happening, you know you've got a good spot. Now, I, I do think that not only individuals, but organizations tend to be in one of these two mindsets. And you could look at different companies and be like, oh, that's clearly a company that's in this mindset. This is clearly a company that's in this mindset. You know, um, so think about that. Think about that as you're doing your next homework assignment um, in the context of mindset. All right, cool. Next thing I wanna share is, let's see. Cyrus question, which is about, Here's your question. Is self-determination theory applicable through all, throughout all institutions and organizations? Well, I think the, the answer to that should be yes. Like I, I don't see any institution that uses human beings or that leverages human um, creativity should, should have an understanding of self-determination theory. So I think Knowing and going into the field with a really solid understanding of what self-determination theory is and what you can do about it will make you all incredible leaders. It will, it, will, it will amplify your leadership capabilities to the nth degree. Now, you have to go and figure out, one of, a lot of the questions that came up is how do, how do you communicate this? And how, does, how do you actually make this stuff applicable in the work environment without seeming too soft? Well. My answer to that is pretty simple, like show the data. Like this is real science. One of the things I always start off my talks with is uh, a statistic from Google Scholar. Like if you do a quick search on Google Scholar, you'll find that there's, um, I don't know, tens of thousands of research papers, tens of thousands of research papers written on self-determination theory. And none of them yet um, have shown it to be false. Like they're all, it's all supportive work. And it keeps building, like they're getting clearer and clearer and clearer on, on the importance of competence 
autonomy, psychological safety, which is tightly related to autonomy. We're gonna have a whole other lecture on that. I think that's the next one. Um, and we're gonna to touch on it right now too, because I'm gonna talk about the relationship between, um, in, the, in the context of competence, I'm gonna talk about the relationship between safety, freedom to fail and competence. And here's how I describe it to my people, to my leaders. I draw a chart, imagine that, you guys probably getting sick of seeing some of my charts. I'm gonna use red, but I draw a graph and I, I compare two things. I love to compare things because it gives us a very clear picture of how the world works, you know? And it's never perfect. All models are wrong, some models are useful, but it's valuable. It's valuable because it gives you a way to describe and explain and, and to remember. So when you have a construct like this, these contextual models, they give you a way to remember it and communicate it in a way that makes sense to people. So here's what I see. So if you have, if competence, the relationship between competence and let's call it learner safety, there's different types of safety. And we're gonna talk about some of the different types of safety in the next lecture, but learner safety, let's just call learner safety as a subset of psychological safety. Let's put it on the left here. Let's put uh, the freedom to fail, the freedom to try and fail. And let's call that, let's call that learner safety. I feel safe to learn. All right. There's, there's a scale, it's a scale, right? Like I can not feel very safe and I can feel very safe just in this context. Like, yeah, I have the freedom to completely fail. Um, now we all know that doesn't exist in business. Like you cannot continue to fail over and over and over again at whatever it is you're doing, or you will not have a job for very long. This just doesn't work. So there is a range of what's tolerable in terms of how safe you feel to learn in any given context. Okay, on the competence scale, let's describe competence in a slightly different way. Let's talk about, um, let's talk about our accountability for progress towards some meaningful goal. Accountability. for learning, let's call that progress, toward a meaningful goal. It's not enough just to learn. The, the, the learning and the competence that you're building has to be towards some meaningful goal. Like it has to be useful to the org, to the team that you're working on. Like you can't just go learn to do be an underwater basket weaver in the context of a software development organization, right? That doesn't work. So you have to learn in the context that's meaningful for the org. Now, without accountability for the learning, without accountability for the learning, remember the matrix that we that I sh shared with you guys in the last um, session, where you've got your, your competence domains, and you have your level of competence that's been achieved by people in your org, without some sort of accountability, here's the patterns that I see. So without some sort of accountability, there's a curve and it's asymptotic and it looks something like this. There's some lower bound to the accountability and there's some lower bound to the safety, you know, below which you don't feel safe to try anything. If, you know, um, you're not gonna get this thing that we want. And the thing that we want is this upper right-hand quadrant. We want achievement and actual growth, achievement, actual competence growth. All right. And this doesn't happen if the safety is too low because people without the freedom to fail, they're not going to try. So they're not going to stretch and they won't learn. Um, if the safety is too low, uh, same thing. If the safety is too low, if the safety is too high. So if you draw some, if you draw a line here, in this range, people will feel some sense of comfort, maybe too much comfort, right? Too much comfort and they're not gonna learn. Too much stress and you're gonna get apathy and you're not gonna get learning. Down here, you're gonna have stress because I'm too scared to fail. I'm too scared to fail. I'm too scared to not, you know, to try anything new, um, but you're being held accountable. So you hold somebody accountable for something, but you don't give them the, the ability to, to experiment and try and learn that's gonna cause stress. 
and burnout over time. And here's going to cause comfort and potential apathy over time. So this is what we're after. So you have to, the point I'm trying to make here with this chart is to maximize achievement and growth. You have to have, there has to be some accountability, some conversations. There's gotta be some accountability um, for learning. There's gotta be some accountability for learning. And over time, if your people are not willing to learn and grow, you may have the wrong folks on the bus. You know, it could be an environment where growing is slow coming or, you know, you're hiring a labor force that maybe doesn't have to have the deepest level of skills. Um, but over time, those people are going to burn out as well. Like everybody needs to grow in some context. And understanding this, I think, is a key leadership skill and understanding this balance and really understanding this accountability factor, like knowing, you know, where to draw the line and how to hold people accountable at what pace and cadence. Remember I told you guys I use like a three month cadence and a six month cadence cadence for the whole org, three months cadence for individuals, you know, in my domain, but having an understanding of how to hold people accountable for learning, when and how, when and how to hold them accountable for learning is a key leadership skill. Um, and every environment's gonna be different, but this is what you want to achieve. Again, competence and learner safety, all right. Go back to the questions. I got one more question. Um, let's see. How are flow and mindset interconnected? This is from Katenge. I thought that was kind of a cool question. That's why I threw it up here. How are flow and mindset interconnected? Um, well, flow, the concept of flow, and a lot of people struggle with flow. Maybe it's the chapters that I assigned to you guys in terms of like, hey, do we always want to be in a state of flow? Do we want to maximize flow? Can there be too much flow? Um, and I think the answer to all of those questions is, yeah, we want to maximize flow for individuals. Um, and we want to, we want to maximize flow for the team in general. Like that's like the key, the peak performance is what flow is really meant to, to be. Now, can we really be in a key, in a state of peak flow all the time? Absolutely not. Um, and is it, is it possible to overdo flow? Like, can you have people that are so embedded in flow that they ignore other things that are important to the business? Absolutely, that's a possibility. Um, that's a question that came up from a couple of different people. But the reality is the more people, the more time, and I think this is an important leadership concept, the more time people can spend in flow, performing, high performing, um, and performing well in the context of their work, the, the, you know, there's a correlation there between how they feel in terms of self-esteem and motivation and their impact on others and their attitude and happiness. We know there's a relationship, according to Mikhail Csikszentmihalyi, between flow and happiness. Um, but we also experience flow. It, it is a scale too, by the way. It's not like you're in flow or you're not in flow. Like, I think that's a little bit of a misnomer. I do think there's a scale in terms of how deeply you get embedded and, you know, you have peak experiences um, in, in your work. But we, it is our job as leaders to try to figure out how do we not monopolize our people's calendars with busy work and status reporting, make sure that there's time carved out. I know this showed up in the discussion forums too. Make sure that your people have time carved out in their daily cadence to actually go and experience, like go work, like get some work done and, and try to achieve flow. And you can't, if you're constantly breaking up your day and you don't have chunks of time to actually get powerful, purposeful, intensive work done, you're gonna stifle their creativity. And I think that's an important thing to understand and to experiment with. And again, every business scenario and situation is different, but this concept of flow is, is very important. So how is it related, going back to the question, how is it related to mindset? Well, if I think if you don't have a growth mindset, it's very difficult to authentically achieve flow in the context of your work because your, your motivations are not right. Like you're, you're, you're motivated by the outcome versus the learning. And if you're motivated by the outcome, you know, that's where this, the cheating, deception, perfectionism, that's where that kind of, those, those distortions from that you get when you have a fixed mindset um, detract from your ability to actually 
get better and improve the thing, you know, the thing that you're doing um, when you can achieve flow. So they're tightly interrelated. They both deal with competence. Like when you're in a state of flow, you're rapidly growing your competence because you're getting the practice, you're getting the um, time and seat, so to speak, the 10,000 hours. If you noticed on the, on the competence versus uh, confidence chart, I drew a 10,000 hour line. Um, it was Mal Malcolm Gladwell wrote the book, uh, Blink, where he talks about, he did some studies of expertise and he talks about 10,000 hours kind of being the magic number. And if you look at any of the great, the great greats at anything in the world, pianists, sports, um, athletes, even business people, even, you know, Bill Gates, I think is one of the examples he used the 10,000 hours of programming that Bill put in before this opportunity presented itself. Um, so according to Malcolm Gladwell, greatness is a combination of putting in the 10,000 hours, building the competence and being in the right place at the right time. So there's a combination of those uh, two things that leads to greatness according to Malcolm Gladwell. Anyway, with that, I'm gonna wrap it up. Thank you for the incredible questions that are coming into Blackboard. Um, I'm, I think I'm gonna continue to use this sort of format to ask, to answer your questions and pull out some other frameworks and models and describe things in different ways. Um, really been enjoying the course as your professor really enjoying the engagement and the questions. So keep them coming and I will see you next Monday. Thanks.